Well, we come to a fascinating section of Jehoshaphat's life, a section which is a staggering change of policy in the kingdom of Judah. Now, Jehoshaphat says, verse 1 of chapter 18, had riches and honor in abundance, and he joined affinity with Ahab. What on earth possessed him to do that? We need to understand precisely what's going on here in the record. We need to appreciate precisely the reason why Jehoshaphat did that. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And it is quite clear that all that had come from God. All that had come from God as a result of godliness of a, a king who in chapter 17 and verse 6 whose heart was elevated in the things of God. And I'm going to attribute to Jehoshaphat the best motives. He was a godly king. He was a king scholar, as we saw in our previous session. A man whose heart and whose mind was elevated into the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, as it were. And as a result of that, as a result of his wisdom and his humility, says the Proverbs, riches and honor were in abundance. He had everything. And he joined affinity with Ahab. And the Hebrew word means to make oneself a daughter's husband. It was a marriage alliance. It was not just making peace. It was through a marriage alliance. If we look at the torturous tree, the unholy alliance, we find in fact that Jehoshaphat gave his son Jehoram to Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. From that came King Ahaziah, which the whole disastrous arrangement spelled almost the extinction of the royal line of Judah. Jehoshaphat didn't really know that was coming, but that was the absolute disastrous fruit of that unholy alliance. If we look at the chronology, we find that Ahaziah was born around the sixth year of Jehoshaphat's reign, quite early in the reign of Jehoshaphat. You work everything back. I'm not going to go through the details. Which means, therefore, that the marriage alliance took place fairly early on in the reign of Jehoshaphat. Chapter 18, verse 1 occurred fairly early in the reign of Jehoshaphat. The first three years, he consolidated his power. After that, there was this tremendous sense of revolution and reformation through Judah, this tremendous sense of teaching and education, this wonderful sense of security, wealth, prosperity. And in the sixth year, at least the sixth year, the fifth year most likely, that marriage arrangement took place. The rest of the chapter happens at the 18th year of Jehoshaphat's reign, because Ahab dies in this chapter. So we're talking about a situation which wasn't happening towards the end, but the beginning of Jehoshaphat's reign. Now, is there anything in the record that tells us of the motive which drove Jehoshaphat to make this marriage alliance? If we come across to chapter 19, we have in the rebuke of the prophet the reasons behind this movement. Chapter 19, verse 1. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate Yahweh. Now that gives us a clue as to his motives. Shouldest thou help, and, and the word means to succor, to support, to help, and to love. And the Hebrew word means to love. And that, that I think unveils for us the thinking process of Jehoshaphat. You see, brethren, says, when you exalt your mind in the things of God... You develop, amongst many other things, a, a caring and considerate attitude towards your brethren. 
Now Jehoshaphat had everything, everything. And when a king has everything, with a considerate viewpoint, he's going to look elsewhere how he can use his wealth to help others. Shouldest thou help? Shouldest thou love? And as he looked across the border, what did he see? Now, we don't know with any degree of precision when Elijah burst up on the scene. We, we, we don't know with any degree of precision when the three and a half years of famine were. Uh, but even if we assume that that was later, when he looked across the border, what did he see? He saw the entrance of Jezebel into the arena of Israel and saw across that border untold chaos and evil. He saw prophets hiding in caves to escape persecution. He saw a systematic and brutalized persecution of the people of God up there in the north. That had never happened before. There had been sort of a, this distoleration of, of uh, righteous people in, in Israel to this time. Not so when Jezebel hit the scene. Now what would you do? You put yourself in that position. You're secure in Judah. You've got lots of money. The kingdom itself is secure. Your mind is elevated. Things have got you. Look across that border and you see the people of God being systematically persecuted. What would you do? And I believe, based upon chapter 19, verse 2, he looked across that border and felt, felt a, a sadness sweep across him and, and seeking to help and to love seeking somehow to reach across that border and try and do something to alleviate that. Now, what are your options? How are you going to do that? How are you going to reach across there and, and give some help? How are you going to do that? Well, I mean, he could make a monetary donation, and the problem with that is it would go straight into the coffers of Ahab and Jezebel. Not really an option. He could invade the north, but that would involve loss of life and destruction. Or he could somehow influence the policy of that kingdom by making an alliance. The options aren't particularly good, are they? It didn't occur to him, as it occurred to Hezekiah later on, to actually send invitations across the north and invite people to come back to Jerusalem. Maybe perhaps he did think about that and maybe it was impossible to do because if you sent messages across the north, Jezebel will pounce upon them and destroy them. You can imagine the debates in the palace. How do I help? What am I going to do? How do we assist these people? His heart going out to his brethren out there in the north. Well, he took... The solution of marriage. And I don't think for a minute that would have been a very easy decision to make. Now, I mean, can you imagine attending the marriage ceremony with Jezebel in that ceremony? I don't think it would have been easy at all. But he felt constrained to help his brethren. You know, brothers and sisters, we can have the best motives in the world for doing things. But if they put our families, our ecclesias at risk, we need to reevaluate the wisdom of that action. Jehoshaphat let loose mayhem and destruction in Judah, the consequences of which he could never have imagined would have occurred. And I believe that, that having a very large heart, he, he underestimated the forcefulness of evil in that palace in Samaria. I don't think he was naive. I just think he underestimated the enormous power of that evil, which, which, which when unleashed in the house of the righteous, almost destroyed the righteous himself. I think he underestimated that. I think that he thought he could influence that court for good. And the reason why I'm giving Jehoshaphat the, the best motives is because of chapter 19, verse 2, to help and to love, to care to reach out. I think he had the best motives. And the options for doing so were limited and he chose a, chose a made a decision which was an unwise choice because he underestimated the force of evil.
Marriage in the Lord is critical. And this chapter illustrates the significance of that. Now, the Lord had said in the New Testament that we should love our enemies, and I'm going to defer the discussion of that until a later study. How do we love our enemies and those that persecute us? But one thing this chapter teaches us is that you don't influence the wicked by marrying into their families. There are other ways of doing that work of influence, and it's not through marriage alliances. Now, coming back to chapter 18, the record says that he made affinity with Ahab. You know, this is the first occurrence of the man's name. He needs no introduction. He needs no introduction. Everyone knows about Ahab. He was stirred up by his wife, marrying an evil woman. He was a petulant king, sullen, spoiled, he couldn't get his own way, easily manipulated by Jezebel. And though he clothed himself in livery palace, in the end, the dogs licked his blood in the pool of Samaria. He had sold himself for evil. Now, verse 2 of chapter 18 says that after certain years, and we can see there from the chronology, we're talking at least 12 years. And it's quite clear that there would have been a little bit of contact through those years, and, and Jehoshaphat perhaps trying to influence the policies of that northern kingdom. As I said before, we don't know the interaction of Elijah in all this arrangement. We don't know when he burst upon the scene. We don't know whether Jehoshaphat contributed to the godly during that three and a half years of famine. We know nothing of those circumstances. The record just passes that all by and comes to the, the last year of Ahab's life, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat's reign. And the record says in verse 2 that he went down to Samaria. How eloquent is that little word, down. In every sense of the word, it was down. And there he is in Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. That word in abundance is Ahab's response to the abundance of wealth that Jehoshaphat had. You know, it's like this little petty king trying to keep up with the Joneses. A magnificent feast, an impressive feast, a huge display of hospitality to impress Jehoshaphat. In abundance, he, he could never be seen to be inferior to the man who he was uh, hosting. Pathetic, isn't it? Pathetic. But that's Ahab. He persuaded him. To go up to Ramoth Gilead. You know, that's the same word used in 1 Kings 21, verse 25, of Jezebel stirring up Ahab. He's learned a lot from his wife. He's agitating and stirring. He's got an agenda in mind, and he wants to persuade Jehoshaphat to go with him. Now, the record says... Ramoth Gilead. Now, if you look at the map here, you'll see that Ramoth Gilead is on the east side of the River Jordan. Samaria is here. In actual fact, there is a route which takes you virtually Ramoth Gilead to Samaria. It's a strategic town. One of the great defensive cities on the eastern border of Gilead. It commands the great eastern plain. Now... This town, as we shall see in a moment, was handpicked by God for the deliberate demise of Ahab. Ahab didn't know that at this point. The king of Syria had recently conquered it. The threat was obvious because there's a direct chariot route from Ramoth Gilead to Samaria, and the king of Syria had that city. The threat was obvious. The next move would have been a thrust into Samaria. Why Ramoth Gilead in the purpose of God? This is the hometown area of Elijah, Gilead. How about that for irony? This is Elijah territory. 
But there's something wonderfully poetic in the justice that God is about to unleash upon Ahab. You see, Ramoth Gilead, which means the heights of the witness heap, was going to itself be a witness to Ahab's wickedness. And the reason for that is, is that we learn from Joshua 21 verse 38 that it's a city of refuge. Now I'd like you to come to 1 Kings chapter 21. Now 1 Kings 21 talks about the murder of Naboth. Ahab couldn't get his way, couldn't get the field. Jezebel steps in, orchestrates the false witnesses, and Naboth is killed. And Ahab merrily goes on his way, happy that now at last he can get this field of herbs. And his joy is interrupted by the presence of Elijah. And verse 20 of 1 Kings 21, Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of Yahweh. Now the fascinating thing about that verse is, is that that word found occurs in Numbers 35 verse 27. Let's come back to that. Look at what Numbers 35 has to say. It's the context of the cities of refuge. And we know the story of the city of refuge, that if you had killed someone accidentally, that you were permitted to flee to a city of refuge. And there you would, you would, you would tell, uh, you, you, you'd make your course to the, to the people in that city and you'd be allowed to come into that city. But the revenge of blood could chase you. Now look at Numbers 35 and verse 27. Verse 26 for context. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he was fled... And the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge. And the revenger of blood killed the slayer. He shall not be guilty of blood. And there it was. Ahab had just recently murdered Naboth standing in this field. And he was found by Elijah. And that's the very word used of the revenger of blood who was permitted to find the individual. So here we have God deliberately, deliberately orchestrating the death of Ahab, who would bring him to the gates of Ramoth Gilead and refuse his entry into that city of refuge because of the blood upon his hands. And there the revenger of blood would find him. And there he would meet his death because he never deserved refuge. Isn't that amazing? That God should organise and orchestrate that ironic end to Ahab. Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? I have found thee, says Elijah. And that man would meet his death. He would never be allowed to enter the gates of that city of refuge. Isn't that astounding? Well, back in the Second Chronicles 18 and verse 3, Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now, in the record itself... That the word king occurs 30 times in the chapter. King of Israel, king of Judah, king, 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 all the way through. It is a chapter which is going to examine who really is the right king. Kings are noted in the Bible for justice and judgment. And we're going to see some decisions here which, which belie the very positions of these two men. And we're going to see who the right king is. 30 times in the chapter, Ahab wasn't fit to be called a king. He's only called a king because he's sitting on a throne. In all other ways, he was bereft of any single royal quality whatsoever. He just looked the part. He was never a true king. But it was Jehoshaphat that had gone down to Samaria. Now, verse 3, he said, and you can imagine, you know, all the feasting and the... the uh, the splendor of that, 
event that Ahab slips in the question. And it's, it's obvious that, that eventually it would come down to matters of state. Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And here is this devastating answer. I am as thou art. Now here's a king of evil, wickedness, brutality, solding, setting himself to sin. And on the other hand is a righteous king whose mind is exalted in the ways of God. And this king, he probably, after he said this thing, probably shook his head in dismay. I am as thou art. What had he done? He'd gone down to Samaria. He was sitting in the gate of Samaria. He was sitting next to the king of evil and wickedness. And he's saying, I am as thou art. That's tragic. Absolutely tragic. To get to that situation where he is linked equally with Ahab. But that's what he'd done. You see, he's trapped. The marriage alliance had put him into a position where an attack on Ahab was an attack on the family. And an attack on the family meant that he was involved with that. Now, now Jehoshaphat was nothing like Ahab. The kingdoms were not the same. But by uttering these words, he was being drawn to this downward spiral until eventually he's saying, I'm just like you, Ahab. That's tragic. Absolutely tragic. My people as thy people. You know, you know, those words were uttered by Ruth many years before. My people as thy people. And what an absolute contrast that was of, of Ruth coming into the constitution and commonwealth of Israel. Identifying herself with the people of God. And this man, so different. It's a tragic statement to make. I am as thou art. By the time we get to the end of the chapter... Jehoshaphat realizes his mistake. He's going to reverse that. But, but at, at this point, he's, he's with Ahab. We will be with thee in the war. We will be with you in the war. You know, the warfare of faith cannot be fought on the same basis as the warfare of unrighteousness. But he's trapped. It's family issues here. He's trapped. How's he going to get out of that? When you mix with the world, and you end up getting to that stage where we are as they are, your interests and behaviour are their interests and behaviour, you've got to extricate, extricate yourself very, very quickly. But Jehoshaphat, at least in verse 4, tried to bring some development of godliness into this whole arrangement and I think that's probably most likely how he viewed this arrangement with Ahab that, that the influence in the court was, was somehow to try and redress all of this evil and to bring some type of, of, uh, of assessment from God's perspective so in verse 4 Jehoshaphat said to king of Israel inquire I pray the word of Yahweh today I mean he, he was trying at least to say well what does God want I mean that never entered Ahab's mind Inquire. That Hebrew word inquire is our word seek. Remember the theme we had in our first study? Seek ye Yahweh while well, he may be found. That's the same word there, inquire. Today. He was not afraid to bring Yahweh into the equation when discussing the issues of state with this man. And, and if, if his motive in, in making the alliance with Ahab was to influence Ahab's life, he, here at least was an attempt to do the right thing, to bring God into this whole equation, even though it's a disastrous situation. Therefore, verse 5, the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men and said to them, shall we go to Ramoth, Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? Ahab has either no idea what a prophet of God looks like, or he deliberately ignores the request, or he deliberately tries to minimize Jehoshaphat's request. Give me a prophet of God. So in come 400 prophets. These were clearly the prophets of Baal. There were 450 prophets of the grove and 400 prophets of Baal who ate at Jezebel's table. 
And this incident is definitely after the slaughter of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It hasn't taken long to replace them. Jehoshaphat asked to hear the word of Yahweh, so Ahab rounds up the prophets of Baal. Just, there's just a whole disconnect here, isn't there? He had no idea the distinction between the prophets of God and the prophets of Baal. Or he sought to avoid Jehoshaphat's point. Now you imagine, imagine this scene. You know, the feast is interrupted. The question's on the table. Today I want to hear a prophet of God, says Jehoshaphat. Today, now, immediately. Word goes out and in come 400 men. And it was so obvious that it was this abundance once more to impress Jehoshaphat. And the great pomp and circumstance of these men came in. And Jehoshaphat would have known immediately who these men were. How uncomfortable do you think he felt? And so Ahab attempts to put words into the mouth of these prophets. Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? You see, he gives them two options. I'm only looking for two options, says Ahab. Either both of us go or none of us go. The question was straightforward, but very cunning. It, it didn't ask the question, should I go to Ramoth Gilead by myself? That wasn't an option. He, he gave the prophets the two options he wanted. And they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. It was unanimous. Imagine 400 of these men screaming out, yes, yes, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hands. But, but look how evasive the answer is. Is the king the king of Assyria? Is the king the king of Israel? Is the king the king of Judah? How ambiguous is that? Yes, we'll deliver it into the king's hands. A very clever ploy, a very deliberately vague answer. The king's hand could mean any one of those kings, enemy or friend. That's how the prophets of Baal answer. Vague, distorted, generalized, and they couldn't miss getting it right. And Joshua is looking at that Verse 6, he just couldn't believe his eyes. Is there not here a prophet of Yahweh besides that we may inquire of him? He wasn't fooled for a minute. Is there not here? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that when Elijah was on the slopes of Mount Sinai, and saying that I, I only am left, and they seek my life to destroy it. God said to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? There's work to be done up in Israel. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Je Jehoshaphat said, is there not here in Samaria a prophet of Yahweh besides? Where was Elijah? One would have thought that the prophet of Yahweh who would have appeared upon the scene would have been Elijah. He's not there. Here, now. Don't you have a prophet of God? And verse 7, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh. But, but I hate him. You see, that becomes the basis of the rebuke of chapter 19, verse 2. Shalt thou love them that hate Yahweh? I hate him. In fact, Young's Literal puts it this way. I, 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 I hate him. It was an open confession of his attitude towards the prophets of God. Now, Jehoshaphat's ears must have been just, just tingling with this information of, of an obvious, absolute declaration of hatred for the prophets of God. I hate him. For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. Ahab should have just stopped and asked himself the question why that was so. Just because you get advice that you don't like doesn't mean the person hates you. Now, now just think carefully, brothers and sisters, about providence here. If godly brethren and sisters are constantly mentioning a problem that we have. Maybe they're right. 
maybe we do need to change. But sometimes we are very quick to dismiss those criticisms because we feel that the brother and sister doesn't like us. We're quick to dismiss the criticism which comes from all quarters consistently because we feel you don't like me. That's Ahab behaviour. Be very, very careful, brothers and sisters. When the providence of God may be trying to say something to you through a consistent message that you're doing something which is not right, don't assume the brother and sister hates you. But you see, sometimes we do. We behave like Ahab. I hate him. The same is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Micaiah means who is like Yah. The son of Imlah. Imlah means whom God will fill up. Now Jehoshaphat turned to Ahab after listening to that and said, at the end of verse 7, let not the king say so. That was a rebuke, actually. That was a rebuke. Don't talk like that, Ahab. So the king of Israel's trapped, you see. So in verse 8, he calls one of the officers, fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. There's urgency here now. You know, how ironic is this, this, this drama? He hates the man. He hates the man, but he's forced to consult him immediately to forward his plans of the invasion. And it reveals a man with absolutely zero principles. He will do whatever it takes to achieve whatever he wants, even if it means consulting God's prophet whom he hates. The man was under house arrest. We know that later on from the chapter, and therefore it would have been quite easy to go get the man. So Ahab knew precisely his name, precisely where he was, and could get him immediately. And then verse 9 gives a picture of this drama. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void place at the entering in of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Why is the record telling us that? I mean, I mean you picture the scene there of these two thrones publicly in the gates of Samaria and all these 400 men jumping up and down, shouting out, prophesying, making ridiculous statements. Two thrones, two kings. And the record says that they are clothed in their robes. What are robes a symbol of? Well, Isaiah 61 verse 10, robes are symbols of righteousness. But there's no righteous judgment here. And the throne of Judah, which in the word of God is the throne of Yahweh himself, is in Samaria. Should never be there. They sat, says the record, in a void place. The Hebrew word is a threshing floor. The threshing floor is the place of God's judgment. And God is about to sort out the wheat from the chaff. God is about to make a judgment which is going to just transcend everything these two kings make. And they're at the gate of Samaria. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. His judgment in Samaria, entirely different from judgment in Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat has placed himself in a precarious position in the broad, in front of the broad gate of destruction, the gate of Samaria. The danger is huge, absolutely huge. But Jehoshaphat's trapped. He's trapped in this arrangement. And the foreign false prophets carrying on like pork chops. What a sight that is. What a sight that is. And the chief prophet now comes along in verse 10, Zedekiah, Yah is righteous. Yah is right. How possibly could he bear that name? There was no righteousness in this, this man. None whatsoever. The son of Kenanah, the word means trader, it's from the Hebrew word Canaan. That's more like it, he was trading in religion. He made himself horns of iron, says verse 10. 
Thus saith Yahweh, with these thou shalt push Syria, and they shall be consumed. I'd like you to come across to Deuteronomy 33. You know, here's a cunning move. Horns of iron. You know, th these people are not stupid. They may be false, unjust, but they are not stupid. Now, why horns of iron? Well, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, in the blessings of Moses to the tribes and to the tribes of Ephraim, which is where Samaria is, verse 17, Joseph's glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of the unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. They're the ten thousands of Ephraim, they're the thousands of Manasseh. You know, what Zedekiah was doing was, was taking a Bible prophecy, making up these horns and saying, this is the fulfillment. Remember the word of God, remember the prophecy that God will take the horns of Ephraim and push to the ends of the earth. Well, now is your chance to fulfill that prophecy, Jehoshaphat. That's cunning. That is cunning. A false prophet appealing to the scripture for Jehoshaphat's benefit and applying that prophecy to their circumstances, that's cunning. What Zedekiah failed to appreciate was, was the blessings of Joseph were because of obedience. And you can imagine him staging this, this wonderful performance, you know, getting these horns of iron. He must, have, he must have had them in the storeroom somewhere waiting for this occasion. And pulling them out and, and pushing them, and, and maybe this great dramatic thrust of pushing back some of these prophets. There we are, you'll push the king of Syria. Unbelievable. Verse 11, all the prophets prophesied so. So they took their cue from Zedekiah. All right, okay. And off they go prophesying about the victory of the king of Syria. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. You know, the world loves to make promises it can't keep. Go and prosper. You'll have a great time. You'll get rich. You'll prosper. You'll get wealthy. You won't have a worry in the world. And it's all lies. For Yahweh shall deliver thee into the hand of the king. And they just kept repeating over and over and over and over again. This is the way the prophets of Baal work. They, they did that jumping up and down on the altar at Mount Carmel. For hours on end, just like a mantra, repeating. And same here, go up, go up, go up. And over there, go up. And the crescendo uh, begins to rise. And over there, they, they respond. until the holy footed prophets are up, and up in the air. Go, go, go. Uh, they, they think that just by repeating those words over and over again, it'll get through to people. The world does that today. It's called advertising. Over and over and over and over and over and over again until subconsciously that thought is in your mind. This is the prophet of Baal kind of behavior. So the messenger in verse 12, off he goes to get Micaiah. And he's going to groom Micaiah and tell him what he needs to do. Verse 12. The messenger that went to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent, with one mouth, says the margin. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. Now, now here is the amazing conflict in the record. Jehoshaphat says, I am as thou art. The messenger grabs Micaiah and says, Micaiah, you make sure that you're like one of them. Make sure that your message is the same as their message. Like one of theirs and speak thou good. So you measure the pressure. You're hauled out of prison. You've got no idea what's happening. And the message is saying to you, make sure you're like the prophets of Baal. Make sure the message is the same. It's what the king wants to hear. That, that's their definition of good. Their definition of good is to please this evil king. That's the message of the world. Conform. Go with the crowd. Don't speak out your own beliefs. Be like us. 
And to his credit, to his credit, Micaiah had this wonderful reply. As Yahweh liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. As Yahweh liveth. That was the favorite phrase of Elijah the prophet. As Yahweh liveth. And later on, Elisha. Micaiah is making the absolute distinction. I belong to people like Elijah and Elisha. And I don't care. But I have to say, if what God tells me I speak, I speak. The prophets of Baal could never use that expression as Yahweh liveth. They never believed that Yahweh lived. They could never, ever use that expression. It was a distinctive Hebrew spiritual expression. God lives. So in verse 14, when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gideon to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, go you up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. So, so he's just brought before the king. He's asked a question direct. And he responds, what he didn't say was this, thus saith Yahweh, go up and prosper. Instead, he told the king what he wanted to hear. He was taunting him. This is a brave prophet. This is a brave prophet. And verse 15, the king said, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of Yahweh? Um, Immediately Ahab knows that this prophet is taunting him and not telling him the truth. And his outburst indicates that Micaiah was used to frequently speaking to Ahab and giving him unpalatable advice. And speaking his own mind. And taunting him. And it's also telling us that Ahab expected the worst from this prophet. And he obviously did not believe his own prophets. He obviously didn't believe his own prophets. How many times do I tell you, tell me the truth? You, know, you can see this, this, this picture of the spoiled king. Verse 16, then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, these have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. Israel scattered, not Judah, Israel. No shepherd. This man was not fit to be king. He was not fit to be upon the throne of Israel. He was a disgrace to that title. No shepherd, no master. You know, those words were alluded to. We haven't got time, unfortunately, this morning to look at this, but those words were alluded to in Mark 6, verse 34, by Jesus Christ, when he saw Israel scattered across the, the, uh, the Galilee hills, sheep without a shepherd. And the context is, is of one in which John the Baptist was making a similar display of courage against Herod, just like Micaiah against this king of Israel. And the Lord knew that these people needed shepherding, needed someone to look after them. This is the disposition of the prophet of God. Even then, caring for the sheep. An amazing statement. So in verse 17, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? Now can't you just hear him whining? I told you he doesn't like me. I told you so. Instead of, instead, of accepting, instead of accepting the unfavorable decision, he criticized the prophet. That's Ahab. Instead of accepting the criticism, we criticize the messenger. That's Ahab behavior, brothers and sisters. Be very careful about that. That's Ahab behavior. And good is defined as what I want to hear. Not what's necessarily good for me. There was no answer from Jehoshaphat. I mean, he, he had been listening very carefully and evaluating Micah Iyer's decision. All Israel scattered across the hills. See, he, he doesn't like me. No, oh, I hate him. 
But but Joshua, thinking about that, thinking about that. So verse 18, again he said, he said, there's a silence here in the record. Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. Now, this is interesting because, you see, Micaiah, Micaiah, unbidden, continues the prophecy. Hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Now, I would love to spend some time on this little parable, but I, but I can't this morning because of the time. But let me just summarize what, what I think it's saying. It is, it is a fascinating window into the court of heaven. You see, there's a third king here in this record. Yahweh sitting on his throne. The judgment is God's, said the book of Deuteronomy. Whenever you make judgment, the judgment is God's. He's aware of these decision-making processes. He's looking at the way we do things. And these two kings in Samaria, in the wide gate of death, one going to go through the gate and end up dead, the other teetering on the edge of that. And God's sitting here, now pronouncing his judgment. Ahab is going to die at Ramoth Gilead. He's pronounced the judgment. And Jehoshaphat's listening to this. This is God's pronouncement. I've tried to make an alliance with Ahab. I've tried to influence the kingdom of Israel. And now this pronouncement is saying that Ahab is going to die. That's God's assessment. And the court of heaven, I think, works like this. That that Yahweh, which, which is the chief angel who bears the Yahweh name, makes a decision. Ahab will die at Ramoth Gilead, and we've seen the reasons for that. And the court discusses the best way of executing that decision. And one spirit, there's one spirit being, makes a suggestion. Another spirit being makes a suggestion. Here's the court of heaven. And finally, a suggestion is made that they would use the lies of the prophets of Baal against themselves. And that suggestion is adopted by the court of heaven. This is an amazing window into the council of heaven. This is the society of the Elohim discussing the best ways of executing the purpose of God. And there's no one in that circle saying, well, that's his idea and not mine and getting funny about it. And there's no one in that circle getting huffy because something was done which wasn't the way they wanted to do it. It's a different committee decision sometimes that we make. And everyone's view is taken on board and respected and discussed until finally a decision is made and they go with that decision. That's the court of heaven. And we who hope to be one day equal to the Elohim need to understand the etiquette of heaven's court. The difference of respect and love that dominates that court. There's no wrangling, no argument, no jealousy, no envy. Absolute harmony in this wonderful discussion as the best way to bring about the purpose of God. So Micaiah makes the point that God is behind all this. And Zedekiah listening to this and he comes across to Micaiah, slap across the face. Verse 23, which way went the Spirit of God from me to speak unto thee? You can imagine the sarcasm. You know, you're saying that, that the angels of God are organizing and, and, and arranging this arrangement. Well, which one of those angels told me to smack you across the face? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. If I'm a liar under the control of God, why did he force me to smite you? You know, this is the arrogance, the sarcasm, and the evil of these prophets of Baal. And Micaiah, although he didn't turn the other cheek literally, just simply, calmly, impassionately said in verse 24, Behold, thou shalt see on the day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. You may not be going to battle, Zedekiah, but you're going to fall, and then you'll understand when you're shaking in an inner chamber for fear of your life, which spirit sent me to smite you. No retaliation, 
Perhaps the basis of the Lord's words, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the left also. If he didn't do it literally, he did it in spirit, didn't he? And Jehoshaphat's looking at this, seeing God's prophet smitten across the face. And in verse 25, the king of Israel said, Take him, Micaiah, carry him the governor, back to Ammon, the governor of the city, to Joash, the king's son. And say in verse 26, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction, with the water of affliction, until I return in peace. How arrogant. I'm coming back. And Micaiah, when I come back, I'll still find you in prison. You know, this is absolute defiance. Absolute defiance of that message. And you know, the tragedy of that scene is, is that Jehoshaphat did not intervene. You know, he's sitting on that throne and he's seeing God's prophet smitten across the face and put back under house arrest. And he didn't say a thing. How far he had fallen. Sometimes it's necessary to stand up and speak the right thing. It may not be easy, it may be difficult. But we're culpable, aren't we? Why didn't he speak up? Why didn't he say, look, look, I'll take him back to Judah. Don't you worry about him. Didn't say a thing. And as Micaiah is being dragged off, in verse 27, Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not Yahweh spoken by me. And he said, Hearken all ye people. And those are the last words that Jehoshaphat listened to as he's being dragged off. Listen to me, listen to me didn't say a thing in the defense of that tremendous prophet. Be like them, said the messenger. Be like them. This man resisted that. He was different in every respect. And as he's being dragged off back into captivity, listen to me. So what are you going to do next? In verse 28, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. You know, if you'd have heard all those things and all those warnings, wouldn't you be a little bit nervous about going into battle? Not Ahab. There, there is not the slightest hint that he listened. There is not the slightest hint that he cared anything for Micaiah's words. There was no repentance. He was determined to get to Ramoth Gilead, come what may. And this, this, this little incident with Micaiah was, was just that, a little incident with Micaiah. He had no intention of listening to the word of God. But Jehoshaphat went as well. Why did Jehoshaphat go up to battle? I mean, he could have easily said, look, look, it's off. Ahab, it's off. I've heard what the prophet said. The prophet has said that Israel will be scattered across the, across the hills. But he went up. Now, now, I've tried to examine this whole thing from every different angle and, and, and trying to put myself in Jehoshaphat's, Jehoshaphat's shoes. Why did he go to battle? He knows perfectly well that Ahab's going to fall. Perhaps, perhaps he saw this as the opportunity for God to change the dynasty of the north by replacing this king. Perhaps. And perhaps by being involved in that, knowing that Ahab would fall, perhaps thinking that there, there would be a better king that would come upon the throne. I don't know. But he went. But you see, Ahab's a sneaky king. In verse 29, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I'll disguise myself. Why does a king disguise himself? Because he knows he is going to be the target and he knows he wants to hedge his bet against Micaiah's prediction. How brave is this man? Bet both ways. Who was the last king who disguised himself? Saul, king of Israel. It's a mark of shame, of cowardice, of a conscience that's just troubled a little bit by the word of God, but not enough 
to repent. It's the action of a devious man. I will disguise myself and we will go to battle. Put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went out to battle. You know, this is the attitude of Ahab. Deliberately, deliberately putting the king of Judah in the forefront of the battle with the robes of state, obviously presenting himself as the king, as a target, while he himself is disguising himself to avoid death. Who, like, who would like a friend like that? And that's the real face of the world. They will do anything to protect themselves, even if it means exposing others to danger. That's Ahab. That's the person you're trying to influence. Now, in verse 30, the king of Syria had commanded the captains, the chariots that were with him, fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. So the providence of God had ensured the lies of the prophets of Baal had prevailed and also ensured that the king of Syria had that singular target in mind. And it came to pass in verse 31 that when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, and look at these words, it's the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat is described as the king of Israel. And the record is telling us that even though he was the king of Judah, he is perceived just to be like Ahab. And that is the judgment of the record on Jehoshaphat's behavior. He's the king of Judah. He has said, I am as thou art. He has refused to stand up for the prophet Micaiah. And in the end, he's recognized as a king of Israel. That's how far he has fallen. He's behaving just like Ahab. That's a tragic, a tragic statement to see in that record. You know, it's like someone coming to us and saying, Ah, oh, I didn't know you were a Christadelphian. What are you doing in this place? And sometimes we look more like Israel than like Judah. It's the king of Israel. And you imagine Jehoshaphat being in the battle and sensing and seeing suddenly all of this attention being drawn to himself as the key warriors of Syria start to close in on him, ready to kill him. And fortunately, he comes to his senses. And the real Jehoshaphat digs deep into spirituality. And in verse 31, he cries out to his God. It's the same expression used of Asa, his father, when he faced one million Ethiopians. He cried out to his God. You know, he would have been absolutely terrified. He'd never been in a position ever in his life where his life had been threatened in warfare like this. And fortunately, fortunately, the real Jehoshaphat came out. No longer is he the king of Israel now. He is the king of Judah. And he cries out to God. And Bread and Sisters, God, and this is the astounding thing of verse 31, God heard him. You know, in, in, in all of this weakness, in, in all of this foolishness, in all of this attempt to be like Ahab and descending down into Samaria, God helped him. You know, I, I find that wonderful, brothers and sisters, absolutely wonderful. That in all that foolishness, God can save us from our foolishness from time to time. If you seek him, you shall be found of him. I find that absolutely astounding. God moved them. It's the same word persuaded as verse 2. God does his own persuading, his own moving. And, and you can imagine, I mean, I mean, a battle is full of noise. And, and this single cry would have probably been indistinguishable from all the noise of battle. But, but known by God, understood by God, this cry coming out, help me, help me. 
And all of a sudden, the forces just melt away. They departed from him. God is exceedingly merciful. Exceedingly merciful. He knows how to deliver the godly from their own foolishness at times. And there's another part of the battle. In verse 32, when the captains of the chariots perceived it was not the king of Israel, the distinction was in calling to God for help. That is the key distinction between the king of Judah and the king of Israel. And when they heard him calling to Yahweh his God, they perceived it wasn't the king of Israel because they knew that Ahab would never behave like that. And God in his promise made sure that happened. Another part of the battle. An archer. Singularly unknown. Drawing back the, the bow with a full strength and unleashing that arrow. One of the angels of God making sure the flight of that arrow is specifically directed. Controlling it as it goes through flight. Whew, straight through. Straight through exactly the spot of vulnerability. Between the joints of the harness, a small chink in the armour, a very small chink, and unerringly the angel of God making sure the arrow penetrates deep into that man. Nothing could save him. The word of God is sure. The word of God is steadfast. The word of God is absolutely reliable. That man would fall. And at sunset he died. The end of an evil king, an evil man. The fitting end. Of a terrible individual. And Jehoshaphat escaping by the skin of his teeth, by the mercy of God. If we say to the world, I am as thou art, we place ourselves right outside the broad gate of Samaria, which leads to death. If we say, I am as thou art, we forfeit all our royal privileges. If we ignore the words of God, we place ourselves in the very danger of losing our lives. And it could only be the desperate appeal to God for help and, and the graciousness of God in hearing that saved Jehoshaphat and will save us. The lesson is very clear. Stay in Judah. And keep right away from the unfruitful works of darkness. On behalf of you all, I'd like to thank my brother Carl for his class. And I hope we're going to think about the lessons in us in the class for ourselves about the alliances we make. Probably the best advice you could give to the young people of uh, the uh, alliance, other than putting on Christ,